Well, good morning. It's a privilege to be able to welcome you this morning to Grace Bible Church. We're so glad that you're able to join us. My name is Craig. I'm one of the pastors here and happy to be with you. Uh, my family was on vacation the last two Sundays. We had a good time up in the Reno area, and I bring greetings from Dayspring Church up there. It's a church plant in Reno from former GBC interns, um, Jason Chang and his wife Naomi. We got to spend some time with them. Um, they will be here in July visiting us. Jason will preach, so it'll just uh, be good, but you can make that connection. Um, some of you know Jason and Naomi from years ago. Some of you don't, and uh, it's truly a blessing to, uh, it was a blessing to be with them and then see what God is doing at the church plant up there in Reno. So, But good to be back with you all, and I'd like to draw your attention to the announcement page. It's on um, page 13, and there are some things there on page 14 as well. Today's the last day to turn in the Alternatives Medical Clinic baby bottle donation. So I've seen these baby bottles with all kinds of money in them uh, floating around the church, and you can get those to Laura Bassett, and uh, she's here. And then, Laura, is that out front at the table there if people haven't, or what's best for you? Okay. Okay. So you can see Laura if uh, if you're hiding one of those somewhere in the building, you could turn it into her, and uh, that'd be great. Also, you'll notice on July 2nd we'll be having a, a fellowship picnic dinner. Uh, so on some months we do fellowship meals upstairs in the fellowship hall, and then on other months we do uh, different things. So this will be outside in the GBC side yard. Um, can enjoy a nice evening together, set up around five, eat around six. And so you could see uh, what things you can bring. It's always a great time of fellowship to be able to just come back together Sunday evening and uh, a beautiful breeze blows through here and uh, it's a good time to spend together. So mark that on your calendar if you haven't already. The main thing to highlight though are opportunities to serve both in the nursery ministry. Uh, I just saw Sose over in the nursery area and there's always a need for helpers for that ministry. It gives young families a, a much needed break during the worship service and so you can see the information there and then also snacks for the refreshments table as well as help with uh, cleanup afterward um, it's a it's a real blessing to have that time in between the services to be able to fellowship connect together grab a little something for your stomach and it takes many hands to make that happen so if you're interested in helping uh, you can see Virginia about that as well well, those are the announcements for this morning, and now we can focus on transitioning to worshiping God, which is why we came here. And our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 100. In just a moment, we'll, we'll read it responsively. And then the first song that we'll be singing is All People That on Earth Do Dwell, which is really just Psalm 100 put to music. And it directs our hearts to many things about God's fatherly care and how he shepherds us as his people and his steadfast love that is upon us. Um, and something we need to be reminded of every week, and we'll, we'll hear about more as the service goes on. And so as we begin our service, I invite you to stand if you're able, and I'll read the um, regular print there, and then if you join with me in the bolded print as we read together Psalm 100. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with thanksgiving. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Let's pray and ask our God's help this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of being able to come and to sing your praises. We ask for your help by your Spirit's work that these things that your word tells us would be things that we know deeply within our hearts, that you would give us faith to believe who you are and what you have done for us in the Lord Jesus, that you would encourage us and strengthen us this morning, and that our, our praise would be a fragrant offering to you of thanks for all that you have done and for who you are. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's lift our voices together in song. <laughs> 
our scripture reading this morning is from the book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, we'll be reading verses 14 through 21. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, beginning of verse 14. Hear the word of the Lord. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. <clears throat> therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, <clears throat> in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Please join me as we pray. Our dear gracious Father, we thank you that we can come to you as your dear and beloved children. Lord, and we know this because you not just told us in your word, but you've demonstrated the ultimate example of love through your son. Lord, we thank you for sending your only begotten son, our savior, to bring us reconciliation to you. Lord, we recognize that there's nothing in ourselves that would commend, us, commend ourselves to you. Nothing that we have done or nothing within us, but only because of your grace, because of your wisdom in choosing us, and because of your great unmatchless love, are we able to respond to that gift, Lord, and to come to you and receive the great salvation that you've offered through the world, through your Son. Lord, we thank you as your people that you are the one who works within us, dear Father, that is Christ working within us, Lord, you, within us to do of your goodwill and pleasure. Lord, we recognize that all of our good works, dear Father, that we can do, we can do so because of your Son who gives us the strength to be able to do so. And truly, because of this, you are the one worthy of all the praise and the honor and the glory, dear Father. We come here humbly to give that to you, dear Father, as we, we gather together as brothers and sisters to gather together to worship before you and to give you our praise, our adoration, our thankfulness, Lord. Lord, you've given, much, you've given us much to be thankful for, dear Father. We thank you, dear Father, that the sun rose today. We thank you for the beautiful weather. Lord, we count this even as a gift from you. And we do give you the praise. Lord, we thank you for our fathers among us, dear Father, as we remember for all this day, and we thank you for faithful of others who have raised us and who have taught us, Lord, and we do pray for them. Lord, we pray for the people of your church. We pray for our church. Lord, you know that you know every special need. And this morning, I would like to lift up to you our, our sister, Charlene. Dear Father, I pray that you'd help her to be able to respond well to the chemo. Lord, that you continue to strengthen her and help her and her husband and her family help them through this trial and help us to stand with them and to lift them up daily in our prayers, Lord. We pray for our sister Kathleen, Lord, that you'd help her through her dizziness, Lord, that you continue to, to give the doctors wisdom in giving her treatments, Lord, and that you continue to care for her. We thank you for those who minister, our missionaries, dear Father, throughout the world. We do pray for them, dear Father, that you continue to bless them and help them in their ministries. We thank you for 
those who minister in Spain, for the Leitons in Oslo. We thank you for the weavers in Canada, or in the Garbanels, dear Father, who minister in Argentina. We pray also for the Jamesons in Israel, and even our home missionaries here, our home church. Lord, for the Maxims who minister in Uganda. Lord, we commit this uh, time of worship to you and pray that you would help us to worship you and to give you the praise and adoration that you deserve and bless Greg as he delivers your word to us, dear Father. May you give him, Lord, the, the freedom to be able to speak your word, dear Father, and to be able to declare the truth of our great and mighty Savior. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to take your bulletin and turn to page 7 as we prepare for the preaching of God's Word. This song is a reminder to us of how beautiful our King is. Isaiah 33, verse 17 says, Your eyes will behold the King in His beauty. And so one day, we're not just going to sing about Jesus. We're going to be singing to him and being able to see him face to face in all his beauty. This song reminds us of just what his beauty looks like, his, etern his eternality, his majesty, his glory, his grace, his splendor. And so I invite you to stand if you are able, and we'll sing together the king and all his beauty. <laughs> 
ask you to bless now the preaching of your word, that it would go forth with great power, change lives, change hearts today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this morning, we'll be looking at Romans 6. Um, Ryan walked us through Romans 5 the last two weeks, and so I invite you to turn to Romans 6. If you haven't already, um, you can find this printed in your bulletin on page 8, and it's also in the Pew Bibles, pages 942 to 943. We'll be looking at Romans 6, verses 1 through 14 in just a few moments. One of the difficult things about going through a book like Romans is that Paul keeps moving and doing so in, in such a beautiful and, and well-argued way. And as we come to Romans 6, even though there's this giant chapter division in our Bible, Paul is really just continuing to pick up on what he's been talking about of this amazing transition that he spoke of in Romans chapter 5. This transition that's happened from being in Adam to by faith being those who are in Christ. And he made, at the end of his explanation there of how that changed everything, he makes this startling statement in verse 20. He said, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. We see these sins just piling up, the sins of mankind just kind of like the, the debt calculator of our national debt or something, just like going, 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 and you, you can't even think of anything bigger than that, right? When we think about the sins of humanity, when we get a glimpse of what lies within our own hearts, and then he says, think of that number, and then he says, grace superabounded. Just add zeros and zeros and zeros to it, numbers we can't even um, imagine, and so it raises this interesting question, though, especially if you're a little bit skeptical of what Paul is saying, which many people were skeptical of what Paul was saying back then. And people even today are skeptical about what the Bible says about the gospel. And so if Paul says that, hey, if, if sin is this much, grace is, I can't even go that high, but like this much, it, it super abounds. And wait a minute, Paul, shouldn't we just keep sinning, keep making that number bigger? And that will make grace bigger, too? That's the question we find in chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue to sin that grace may abound? Now, we probably don't even need to read the rest of the chapter to have an idea of what the answer should be, whether um, this is your first time in church or you've been here for a long time. It seems like it's not a good idea to say, yeah, Christianity is really all about sinning more. <laughs> seems kind of strange. We're, uh, that doesn't seem like the right answer. In Sunday school, you can get a piece of candy by saying, that's a bad answer. But the question that this passage begs for us is one that I find really interesting. Even though we may implicitly know, Christianity doesn't seem about saying, hey, sin all that you can because it makes grace look better. Something seems strange to us about that. How do we actually answer that objection? If God is really this gracious, what does that mean about our sin? And how we answer that question is a really big deal. Because I think by default, we go to answers that are unbiblical. We go to answers that make sense to us as humans, but actually are in contradiction to the gospel. Many of the answers that we might come up with if someone said, hey, should I just keep on sinning? Isn't that what Christianity is all about? At the end of the day, we often say something like this. Well, yeah, I mean, God's grace gets you into heaven. It forgives you of all your sins. But then, I mean, then you need to work and do those Christian things. Don't do those bad things. Do those good things. And that's what's going to get you a good seat in heaven. That's what's going to get you better parking spots. That's what's going to let you come to church on a Sunday thinking you did a good job. Something like that, right? The other way we do it is this. Yeah, being saved is all of grace, but there's all these things that you don't know yet about being a Christian. 
And if you don't do those, we're just going to shame you for it, and you'll feel bad, and it'll make you hopefully start towing the line as a Christian. And so either, like, no matter how we answer that, do you see what that's doing? It's saying that justification, being declared righteous and having sins forgiven, yeah, that's all of grace, but sanctification, growing in holiness, that's by striving, and grace has nothing to do with that. And Paul says something very different. What he says here in chapter 6 is that grace does far more than just forgive your sins. God's grace completely changes how you are able to live. Grace makes you dead to sin, and God's grace also makes you alive to God. And as he unpacks what that means, it really helps us think about wow, am I viewing God's present grace in my life in relation to my sin in the way that the gospel does, in the way that Paul unpacks here? So let me read for us our passage, Romans 6, verses 1 to 14, and we'll pray and ask God's help and consider it together. Hear God's word. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, that we too might walk in newness of life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died... He died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. So far, the reading of God's word. Let's pray and ask that he'd help us as we consider it this morning. Our Father in heaven, we confess that we desperately need to better understand your grace. So often it's something that's so small in our lives. Our sin is something that's so big and so prevalent. Will you help us to see the wonder of what Jesus has done through his life, death, and resurrection and what he's doing in us now by your spirit? Help us as we consider your word. May your spirit illumine our hearts to better understand and believe these things. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we consider this passage this morning, you you may notice it's theologically rather weighty. Uh, We could say that pretty much for all of Romans, I guess. Uh, But hopefully we can unpack it in a way um, that makes sense to us. And we'll do so considering three points. First, we'll consider what happened to Jesus. Second, we'll consider what happened to us. And then third, we'll consider what we do now. So what happened to Jesus, what happened to us, and now what we do, what we do now. So first, let's consider what happened to Jesus. And again, this is picking up what's happening in Paul's argumentation in this big picture that he's just given in Romans 5. The story of human history can be described as a a story of two men, Adam and the second Adam, who is the Lord Jesus. And as those who are born into Adam, our story is bound up in Adam's story, isn't it? We are part of his family. And part of what that means is that we come into this world under the dominion or under the rule of sin and death. 
We are under sin and death's power. We can't escape it on our own. We see the effects of sin and death everywhere we look, whether we look within or we look all around us. But something amazing has happened, right? That's the the beauty of this gospel story. The second Adam came, and Jesus overthrew the reign of sin and death. And the incredible thing is that by faith, our story becomes no longer bound up only by Adam's story, but our story is bound up in his story. And so we have to thoroughly understand what happened to Jesus, and that's what Paul explains in verses 9 and 10, and then it helps us understand what has happened to us. And so he's kind of buried that within this passage, but this is what he's assuming, and then he makes explicit there in verses 9 and 10. And you can follow along as I read. We know that Christ being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. And so if we just stop there, Paul is really drawing out something for us. He says there are two things you need to know about Jesus. There's far more, but we can boil it down to this. Jesus died and Jesus was raised. And what Paul wants us to understand is how different Jesus' glorified life is now on the other side of his resurrection, on the other side of death. And we want to see that in relation to what it means for him about death and what it means for him about sin. And so let's just consider those in turn. And and I understand we're we're diving into the the theology up front, but we're going to see how it applies to us as we go. But let's consider Jesus' relationship to death. When the Son of God became incarnate, which means when Jesus took on flesh and became the God-man in the person of Jesus Christ, he did so entering into the world that Adam had brought about, right? The world that was ruled by sin and death. And Jesus entered that world where death reigned. Even his own body was marked by weakness and mortality. He was moving toward death in his body just as much as we are moving toward death in our own. Because this is what Adam inherited for all humanity. And Jesus came born as one of us. But when Jesus lived a perfect life and then died a substitutionary sinless death and he was raised... The scriptures tell us that he wasn't just resuscitated or brought back to life like people like Lazarus had been, right? Where they're only to die again, where death's shadow still loomed over them. And it was great they were back, but we knew we'd still be marching toward the same thing because we're under the same rules. But instead, when Jesus was raised, Paul says, death no longer has dominion over him in verse 9. Jesus has conquered death. Jesus no longer lives under death's shadow. Death is no longer a possibility for the risen Jesus at all. And so that changed through his death and resurrection. So also, Paul says, his relationship to the power of sin has changed. It says he died to sin once for all. Now, this can be a little bit different for us to understand because our experience of sin as sinful people who have a sin nature and also sin is a little bit different than Jesus's. But think about this. We know that Jesus, being conceived of by the Spirit, didn't have a sin nature in the same way that we do. But he entered a world where sin reigned and people sinned against him and he was tempted and yet was without sin. And so in this way, Jesus also came into the world under the power of sin. But now, having withstood all temptation and having never sinned, when he died and when he was raised, he died to sin once for all. That means he's no longer under the rule or power of sin. And also what it means is all temptation for Jesus to sin is gone. And instead, Paul says, now the life that he lives, he lives to God. 
Now, this is also interesting to think about, right? Because Jesus amazingly lived every moment of every day to God and for his glory in a way that none of us ever have. But what Paul is saying is this, that Jesus now in his resurrected, glorified state is able to live for God in a way that unglorified humanity is not. The way that we were intended to live always for the glory of God, but never attained because of Adam's sin. Now, I know that's kind of a lot, right? <laughs> Even as I say those things, immediately what comes to my mind is this. We could ponder these things forever. What does it mean that Jesus is dead to sin and alive to God and that uh, he is set free forever from death. But Paul wants us to see clearly what happened to Jesus. When he died and when he was raised, his relationship to sin and death were forever changed. And all of the power and bondage of being in Adam was gone forever from his existence. He has entered into a new phase of life. And Jesus didn't move backward to where Adam was before the fall, but instead he took it beyond to what Adam never experienced, glorified life with God and an unending freedom from sin and freedom from death, eternal righteousness, eternal life. Why does all this matter? Because it's essential to understand that, that just as in Romans 5, we find out that what has happened to Adam happened to all of us, that we all experience sin and death now because of Adam. It's essential to understand that as a believer, by faith in Christ, what happened to Jesus has happened and will happen to everyone who believes in him. And the implications for that are amazing when it comes to our understanding of our relationship to sin. And so that's our first point. What happened to Jesus in his death and resurrection in relationship to sin and death? But now we come to our second point. What happened to us? This is what Paul wants us to see. And Paul right away uses language that might be a little bit confusing to us. He uses baptism language. We see this in verse 3. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Now, it's helpful to understand that although it's a hugely significant phrase, the baptism language here really functions as shorthand for our salvation experience as a whole. Being baptized is usually the culmination of this whole process of coming to faith in Christ, hearing about Jesus, turning from our sin and believing in Jesus, with all that brings, being justified in faith, and then following him in baptism. And so in that way, Paul is using it as this shorthand because it's the outward initiation into the entirety of the Christian life. It's what we do outwardly that signifies what God has been doing as a process within us internally. And so, Paul's using baptism here as shorthand for the conversion experience. But, but since he's brought it up, I think it's important to just say a few words about baptism. Paul makes it clear throughout his argumentation that there is no work of ours that saves us. Our faith, and simply faith in Jesus Christ, is what saves us. The thief on the cross was never baptized. Believers before Christ were not baptized, and yet they were saved because it's only by faith. They were looking forward. We are looking back to what Christ has done. But after Jesus' ministry, the New Testament knows nothing of an unbaptized believer. It's what Christians do in accordance with what the Lord Jesus commanded to happen in the Great Commission. And it's also really significant for us as believers it's been given to us by God as a sign of what God has done in our hearts inwardly in our lives. And it signifies it to, that to us visibly, and it also puts that on display to others as well. And so if I, 
I think that if we were to say to Paul, Paul, I'm a Christian, I am trusting in Jesus, but I'm not baptized, I think Paul would respond this way. Why haven't you been baptized? Let's talk about that. And that is the same response I would give. If you're here today and are trusting in Jesus, and I know it could be a person who's been in the church for many years and hasn't been baptized for various reasons, maybe a young person who's coming to better understand your relationship with Christ and you're finding yourself saying, you know what, I really believe in Jesus. I think the response of Scripture is, let's talk about being baptized and following Jesus in this way. I'd love to start a conversation, and the elders would love to start a a conversation with you about what you believe and about what may be keeping you from following Jesus in this way. And so just know that if you find yourself in that state, reach out to any one of the elders, and we'd love to get that conversation started. So that's kind of a side note about baptism. Uh, But as a Baptist church, it seems fitting to talk about it now and then, right? And Paul brought it up, so I can blame him. Now back to Paul's argument, okay? So so what I want us to do is this. When you hear baptism, think salvation experience as a whole, coming to faith in Christ. And he shows us two things that have happened to us. First is conversion, which is shown in our baptism, unites us to Christ's death. It unites us to Christ's death. By faith, we are united to Christ's death. So much we are baptized into it, Paul says. Our union with Christ in his death, even though it's something that we can't tangibly see, even though it's signified in baptism, it's so thorough that in verse 4 he says, we were buried with him by baptism into death. We've been buried with Christ. We've died with Christ. When you became a Christian... What happened is you were joined to Christ in his death and in his burial. So that what happened to him in his death has happened to you in yours. Your relationship to sin and death have forever changed once you came to faith in Christ. And we find this summarized here in verse 7. It says, For the one who has died has been set free from sin. And so there's the change with the power of sin. And then verse 8, if we believe we died with Christ, we believe we will also live with him. What does that mean? Just as the Lord Jesus died and now lives forever free from the power of sin and death, so also you, believer, since you have died with him, are no longer under sin's reign and you will be raised with him in resurrection life when he returns. That is what has happened to us in turning to faith in Christ. Your union with Christ in his death has set you free from the power of sin and death. But then secondly, conversion shown in baptism unites us not only to Christ's death, but also to Christ's life. This means that as we've said, we will be raised from the dead, never to die again, just like Jesus currently exists now. But being united to Christ in his life also means that we're able to live a new life now, a life that's like Jesus' life. Notice verse 4. As Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, here was the purpose of it we too might walk in newness of life. We've been united with him in his resurrection life and that results in a changed life for us. It's that life that we saw in verse 10, the life of living to God that has begun in our lives even now. Your union with Christ, returning to him in faith, shown through baptism, enables you to live for God because you've been united to him in his life. Now, that could sound like a lot of just kind of theological jargon, perhaps. But this is a really amazing change. And especially when we think back to what was going on in chapter 5. We saw that this power over sin and living a life that's pleasing to God, it's something that wasn't possible for those who are in Adam. And this may be something that we don't really realize happens to us when we come to faith, because it's, it's something that's 
primarily positional. <laughs> we don't all of a sudden change color or something that shows, wow, something in you is radically changed. And for many years of my life as a Christian, I didn't really understand that God's saving power wasn't just about forgiving my sins, but it was also about fully changing my relationship to sin even now and forever. And that's what Paul is saying here. And part of the reason I didn't realize that is things tend to feel the same on the other side of conversion. You know, some sins may immediately fade when we come to Christ. And I've talked with many of you and there have been particular sins that, boy, I turned to Christ and that was no longer a temptation for me. And then other sins, they are with us to the grave, aren't they? And so we can lose sight of how profound this change really is. But Paul says the first step in battling our sin is really realizing what God's grace has done. It has set us free from that which we were completely entangled in. There's a story that's told of a man who went to a market. And at this market, they sold vegetables and meats, kind of a farmer's market type thing. Um, and he went there just to see what was being sold. And as he was looking over the produce, he noticed a strange sight off to the side. He saw a bunch of quail that just kept walking around in a circle. Now that's kind of weird. You've got produce here, you've got meat available, and then quail walking in a circle. And so as he approached, he noticed that these quail, this, this group of them, they had one string tied around one of their legs. And then all the strings were pulled together and tied around this metal ring. And the owner of these quail had put a stake in the ground and put the ring over it. And so all of these quail were walking around in a circle with one leg tied to a circle. Seems like a great thing to do if you have one leg tied up to a bunch of other birds. And so these quail had figured this out. Well, this man had a soft spot in his heart for quail. He didn't particularly like eating them, and he thought this is kind of a strange existence to just walk in circles your whole life. And so he had an idea, and he went up to the owner of the quail, and he said, how much for the quail? And the owner gave him a price, and he, he paid him the money. He said, now set them free. And the owner said, wait, what? Um, how about I just bag them up? <laughs> They're kind of your problem now. No, I want you to set them free. Cut their strings. And so the owner, having been paid, went and cut all the strings of the quail. And much to their surprise and everyone else who had kind of gathered around to this strange sight, the quail continued to walk in a circle as they had done for their whole lives. Now, the man who had just bought them, he thought, well, this is a ripoff. I wanted to change their lives. Like, this is, a, this is my good deed for the day. Do something about this. I have set them free. Do something about it. And so then the owner ran through the circle of quail, stirred them all up, shooed them away, and much to everyone's surprise, they flew about 10 feet away, landed, and began walking around in a circle as they had their entire lives. I don't know if that story is true. I kind of highly doubt that it is. Um, but I think it illustrates something really well for us. We so often live our lives like quail, don't we? Paul is telling us that we have been set free from sin. And yet we are so used to going around and around in the circles of our sin that we may not realize how radically different everything is because we have been united to Christ in his death and in his resurrection. Sin's power over us has been broken. Even those things that seem so deep, like they're, they're just a part of our personality or those things that will we'll never, we feel like we could never be without this way of thinking or living. Paul says that because you were united to Christ in his death, that thing, no matter how deep it goes, it does not have power over you in the way that it did when you were not united to Christ. And it also says you don't have to keep walking in the same circles of your sin. Christ's resurrection power is even now presently breaking in upon you in such a way that you can walk in a way that's different and that's in accord with the life of Christ. And when it doesn't feel like this is true, Paul says, you know what? I want you to look at your baptism I want you to picture yourself going under that water and coming up a wet, dripping mess. 
And I want you to understand that just as surely as you went under the water and were pulled up out of that, so surely have you died and been buried with Christ and since power over you been broken. And so surely have you been raised to newness of life in him. Even if all you feel is that you're just walking in the same circles that you have been your whole life. You see, God's grace doesn't stop at forgiveness. The work of Christ changes your life right now by setting you free from sin's power and enabling you to live for the glory of God. Now you might say, okay, I realize this. (laughs) Those are good things to think about, but what now? And this is where I love what Paul is doing here in chapter 6. He gets very practical. And it brings us to our third point. What do we do now? What do we do now in light of these things? And in verses 11 to 14, Paul gives us some wise and helpful instructions on how to live. And I just want to boil those down into three things just to hold on to. The first is reject sin's reign. Reject sin sins reign. Notice verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. And then verse 13 describes this as presenting that we present our members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, and it's calling us not to do that. Instruments here, I think, Um, it's better to look at it not as a violin or something we use to play, make music, but in the military context, it's often translated as weapons. And so the language, the imagery that Paul uses is these things are true of you now, but there is this temptation and it's one of allegiance and kingship and weaponry. He says, don't let sin continue to reign as king in your life. Don't continue giving in to those wrong passions that you still find at work within you. Don't continue to let your body be used as a weapon for unrighteousness in the world. You see, sin is happy even though its power over you has been broken. Sin is thrilled as a power and Satan behind that power for you to continue offering yourself as a weapon for sin to do its destruction in the world. But instead, Paul says, reject sin's reign and then do the opposite, which is the second thing he says, present yourselves to God. Reject sin's reign and then instead present yourselves to God. He says, present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. You don't have to follow in the same way you used to live serving sin. You can choose to offer yourself and your body, your members, this this embodied existence that you have, you can offer it to God. And what I love about this is it's present yourself as you are now with all your weakness, with all those passions that still go astray. Find yourself in that battle with sin saying, I'm choosing not to offer offer myself in the way I always have and I'm bringing myself to you, God, to use as a weapon for righteousness, a weapon for righteousness in the world to fight against sin's ongoing reign. You know, this is really the wonder of our new life in Christ. We can think of every part of our whole being. He says, offer yourselves, and then he speaks of our members, but we can think of every part of us And how we used to use that and sometimes are still tempted to do so for unrighteousness. And now there's a way to use ourselves, to offer ourselves in righteousness. These hands that we so often have used to build our own kingdom and to grasp things for ourselves and to push others away. God enables by his spirit us to use our hands to do good to others to hold out the love of Christ to them and to lift our hands in worship to the God who has saved us. These tongues that we have so often used to destroy people around us, to boast in our own things and to tear others down, God now uses our tongues that we can speak words of life and grace to the people who hear us. 
that we can carry with those same tongues the good news of the gospel of forgiveness in Jesus Christ, that we can use our tongues to give praise and thanks to God. Our feet, which used to take us places we shouldn't go, and to go and walk about this world serving ourselves, our feet are now ones that can bring the gospel of peace, that can function as taking us as agents of God's love and grace in this world. Our eyes, which used to be all about seeing things for our own gain or the lusts of the flesh or desires that we have, God transforms our eyes so that we see the truth and goodness and beauty of his created world, so that we see the needs of our neighbors around us, so that we see the ways he's trying to use us in this world for good. You see, that's where we can reject sin's rule with every part of us, and we can instead offer, present ourselves, all of us, even our minds and our emotions, to God for his glory and for the good of the world. And so reject sin's reign, present yourselves to God, and then finally, consider what is true. Consider what is true. Paul is amazing when he talks about the Christian life. And what's so amazing about it is how he keeps the indicative, the truth of what God has done as first and foremost, what then drives the imperative, the command of what to do. And if you were following along, you may have noticed I jumped to some commands and skipped over the first one, which is there in verse 11. It says, so also you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And then Paul ends the section with another indicative. For sin shall not have dominion over you because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. Paul says that what's essential to this whole process of, of battling sin and fighting against its rule and living to God is to consider what is actually true of us. You know, this isn't wishful thinking. This isn't like mind over matter stuff. If I just think that I'm really tall and strong and people think I'm great, then I'll be that. <laughs> it obviously hasn't worked. Uh, instead, it's, it's considering, reckoning what is actually true and saying this is how things really are. You know, I've mentioned this a little bit already, but I think now's the time to think about it a little bit further what can be so difficult in this life of faith that we live is that things look the same right now until glory. You know, we talk about what happened to Jesus in his death and in his resurrection and that now we already share in that now. But when Jesus was raised, things already looked very different about him. He's able to somehow enter buildings without opening a door. And he's able to be taken up into heaven in a cloud. I mean, he's entered into a glorified existence that is different than our own. But when we come to faith, nothing changes outwardly about us, does it? And as we go on in the Christian life and we look at ourselves, we look at ourselves in the mirror, what do we see? We see a child of Adam, just like all the other children of Adam all around us. And you know what? When we look in our hearts, what do we see? We still find twisted desires and battles with sin, just like before we became a Christian. But just because something may look the same on the outside doesn't mean that it is the same as it once was. You know, if we think about weddings, it's an amazing reality of how just words spoken change things forever. And as one who's officiated weddings, one of the things that I find amazing is you can have this couple and maybe, maybe they'll never dress up like that again or maybe they will or not. But, so everyone's dressed up, but they say their vows and their, change, their clothes don't change, nothing changes, but before the law, before God, everything has changed. When you travel to another country, uh, we took a trip to Canada not too long ago, and I, I just find it amazing that the dirt's the same, the air is the same, but there's this line that we've arbitrated, 
And boy, once you cross that line, everything changes. The money's different, the coffee's different, the words are different, the, your, your status as a citizen is different, right? Paul realizes that even though everything looks the same, that's all the more why we need to consider, to reckon what is actually true. Just as we may go back to a passport and say, wait a minute, U.S. citizen here in Canada or here in Mexico, or just as we may look at our wedding ring and say, doesn't feel any different, but everything has changed, we go back to that gospel word again and again, and it says, this is what is true of me now. And I want to just close by talking about what that feels like, the present experience of it. I've been debating how to talk about this. And so when in doubt, just say it. It's not a good motto, but I'll give it a whirl. <laughs> I, that's not what I tell my kids. Uh, I'll tell you that for sure. <laughs> See how it goes. If I think of progress in the Christian life, it kind of begins as I mentioned before, realizing that grace forgives your sin. And then, then you come to these indicatives and you realize, whoa, wait, everything has changed because I've been united with Christ in his death and resurrection. And what it led to for me is thinking, now that I know this, now it's going to feel completely different, right? We just heard a sermon that said we don't have to be quail anymore. Those strings are cut. But then you, you stand up to walk out and your sinful heart is still there. You get in the car on the way home, and nothing's changed. It's even worse, it feels, because you're expecting that it should be better. And so I've felt that letdown, and maybe you feel it as well sometimes, where we hear these glorious indicatives, but then our experience feels so different. And it's kind of like, what is wrong with me? Paul doesn't view it this way. Why isn't it happening this way in my life? But Paul does view it this way. Paul understands the difference between the present experience of sin and what is actually true. And I think what's really helpful to realize, if you can hang with me, is this parallel between how he talks about death and then how that relates to our experience of sin. Because everything has changed about our relationship to death, right? And we will be raised with Christ one day. But what's our present experience like? Death is still present. You see death all around. Every day you feel death's effects on your body. The longer you live, the more aware you become of death. The louder death will speak to you. But death has forever lost its power. It's forever lost its victory over you. Its sting has been removed because you are united to Christ in his life right? And even now, even though outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we're being renewed day by day. Resurrection life is at work in us now. We are now new creation in Christ. And one day we will experience the fullness of that just as Jesus does. Eternal, immortal, glorified life forever when death is no longer a present reality. Do you see how that works? Death is present, but its power over us has broken, but we're still very aware of its presence, and then one day its presence will be gone. Well, that's really helpful when we think about our experience with sin. Because you know what? Sin is still present. You see it all around. You feel its effects on your body, in your body and in your heart. Passions tempt you to offer yourself to unrighteousness. Often the longer that we're a Christian, the more we become aware of sin's presence. The more we see it all around and the more we see it in here. But it's still true that sin's power over you has been broken. The strings that bound you to sin have been cut. And even now, even though sin is present, it is defeated, and you are now able to defy its reign. And you're able to present yourself, even now, to God. And one day, you'll experience the fullness of that, just as Jesus does right now. 
with sin's presence forever gone and knowing what it really feels like, what it really is to live to God forever. You see, just as the presence of death doesn't tell us that the resurrection isn't true or will never happen to us, so also the presence of the temptation to sin, it's not telling us we haven't been set free from it. What is true of us now is that Jesus has taken us from the power of law and sin and death, and he has brought us into the rule of grace and righteousness and life. And we experience it now in part, and one day we will experience it in its fullness. So how do we respond when tempted to think that grace just gives us forgiveness? We respond by saying this, God's grace gives us so much more than just forgiveness. It changes our relationship to death and sin forever. We've been united to Christ in his death, and sin and death no longer have power over us. One day they will no longer be present. We've been united to Christ in his life, and so we can live even now to the glory of God. And one day we will know glorified life forever. And that's not because you've been a good little boy or good little girl. It's because of the grace of God that's received by faith in Jesus Christ. May God help us now to know even more and more and to depend upon that grace more and more each day until Jesus returns and we experience the fullness of it. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, your word opens up who we really are and what our experience really is. Thank you for the profound work of Jesus. Help us to better and better understand it. Help us to better and better believe it and to more and more apply it as we look at our lives and the new life that you are working out in us by your spirit. Thank you for the confidence that this is all of faith and that one day we will receive the fullness of it and be with you forever where we will be your people and you will be our God and we will truly know what it is to experience the glory of God forever. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, now we come to the part of our service where we participate in the Lord's Supper, where we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And just as one might look at a passport or a wedding ring to be reminded of what is really true, so also the Lord's Supper, in an even greater way, is a visible sign to us of who we really are now. The bread and the cup proclaim that you aren't who you were if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus. You have died and you've been raised with Christ. Your sins are forgiven. New life is yours and glory is your destiny. And these signs, the bread and the cup, they proclaim that to us, even if we might not feel it. And they strengthen our faith in these things. This is a time that's for believers. It's for those who know that the only hope they have in the midst of their sin and the battle with death is through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. If that's something that you're trusting in and you've been baptized, then we invite you to partake with us and to have your faith strengthened in this way. If you still wonder about that or you've been trusting in Jesus but haven't yet been baptized, we ask that you um, not partake, but we are glad that you're here. And we invite you to consider the wonder of all that changes through simple faith and trust in Jesus and his work. And we'd love to talk with you further about that. And so as we uh, prepare for the supper, let's sing together, Come Behold the Wondrous Mystery, which focuses our hearts on the wondrous mystery of what Christ has done for us that we celebrate together in the supper. <laughs>
Our Father in heaven, we give you thanks for your love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And not only that, he was raised. And he was raised for our justification. And we too have been raised with him to newness of life. We thank you for the certain promise it is of what that kind of life will be. And we thank you that even now we are experiencing heavenly life broken in upon us by your spirit. This life of faith is long and it's hard. And we battle with sin and we grow tired and weary. And so we pray that in this small meal with these signs of the eternal feast that is to come, that you would strengthen our faith, that you would renew our strength, that you would help us to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul gave us these words. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and eat. And then in the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. And then he says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes our Lord Jesus will come again one day, and even so we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, our song of response this morning reminds us that everything we have comes from Christ, and that this walk of faith until one day it becomes sight is completely strengthened by the grace of God that we've received in him. And so I invite you to stand if, we're a if you're able, and we'll sing together, Yet not I, but through Christ in me.
now hear these words of blessing of what God is going to continue to do in you. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. You may go in that grace. Amen.